Good evening, folks. My name is Hamza, and welcome to the series where we interview the industry leaders in the plastic injection molding industry. I'm an account executive at Simform, a division of Maya HTT. Maya HTT has proudly served more than 7 million users across the globe in the last 40 years um, and provide services in 3D simulation and software engineering. Today, we have a guest who is extremely knowledgeable in all things related to plastic manufacturing. Is equally the managing director at Plastic Manufacturing Technologies, Mr. Clay Stevens. How are you doing today? Hey, great. Thanks for having me, Hamza. That's great. <clears throat> All right, Clay, uh, tell us a little bit more about Plastic Manufacturing Technologies and in what activities uh, you have been recently involved in. Yeah, well, PMT or Plastic Manufacturing Technologies, PMT for short, uh, we started as a manufacturer's representative in 2016. Uh, specifically for injection molding, blow molding, and mold making for mostly low volume projects. Uh, but in 2022, we began to really investigate 3D printing and how that technology can benefit the molding and mold making applications. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we still provide sales representation for principals uh, providing injection molding, blow molding, rotational molding services uh, for prototype and production, uh, as well as CNC milling services for both prototype and production. Um, we have a 3D printing unit as well for design, consulting, uh, 3D printing of parts um, and other engineering services. Uh, our main innovation, however, a big differentiator uh, is our 3D printed metal molds, which can be printed in both aluminum or steel for both prototype and production molding applications. The technology allows for production tools to be produced in up to 50% faster time than the conventionally milled uh, steel molds mm -hmm. while using an average of 80 percent less material uh, for the same or less cost than with conventional manufacturing alone i see uh well certainly looks like uh, i mean you guys are really uh well vested into the uh 3d uh printing world but uh for viewers who are listening us uh t tell us a little bit more in actual term how does it actually benefit the customer yeah, so obviously there's that reduction in, <clears throat> excuse me, molding cycle times uh, that's native from conformal cooling and heating. Uh, 3D printing allows us to print in those cooling channels or heating channels, uh, mm -hmm. allowing for more efficient part cooling and heating and thermal cycling of the mold uh, that has the opportunity to significantly reduce cycle times and boost the production efficiency of the molding process. Um, also, it allows for more adaptable uh, cost effective tooling solutions. For example, mm -hmm. we always have the ability to print 100% of the mold, uh, but we can also print sections of the tool that might benefit more from 3D printing, especially if a, a part that needs a mold has some very simple geometry areas and some complex geometry areas. The most cost effective solution may be to conventionally mill the simple geometries, but 3D print and weld in or bolt in uh, the tool sections that have complexity. Um, we also have an opportunity with 3D printing to commonize our mold bases. So if there's a customer with a variety of products that fit into that same part class, as long as they all fit within the same mold base, we can help a customer reduce their investments, especially on high mix rate projects um, or low volume projects and conserve and transfer investment shared across multiple programs. Um, there's also an increase uh, opportunity for increased design flexibility. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, 3D printing is not uh, limited based on part geometry. Um, so designs and geometries that were once thought to be too expensive or too complex based on conventional design concepts are now possible to be considered. Um, in addition, one of our more innovative developments that has been made possible with 3D printing is high volume production, right? Steel mm -hmm. tools, production steel tools, large dimension, small dimension parts, but really making it cost effective to 3D print tooling. Um, that includes or involves printing sections of the tool in parallel, which we can spread that out across multiple printers. So that saves a significant amount of print cost and time, delivery timing of the tool. Uh, we combine innovative laser welding to enhance the durability of our weld joints compared to mm -hmm. conventional welding that distorts the substrate dramatically. Uh, our CNC milling time is typically reduced by 50 to 60 percent compared to a conventional project where almost 100 percent of the, the machining time 
would be on a CNC mill. Um, and then we combine laser heat treatment uh, as a uh, supporting service to enhance and extend the mold life, especially in areas where we expect high wear, uh, parting lines, sprues, um, and then in general, the laser heat treatment does not distort the substrate as well, similar to the laser welding, uh, which allows us to uh, reduce the hard milling to virtually zero or if, if any, um, after heat treatment. So we'd be doing our printing, mm -hmm. our welding, our CNC milling, heat treatment, and then in most cases, no hard milling. I see, very interesting. So, it, I mean, all in all, uh, plastic manufacturing technologies can really serve as a one-stop shop yes. uh, uh, for customers at large. Um, so now, uh, Clay, tell me a little bit about uh, the challenges that, that you have observed in the plastic injection uh, industry though? Yeah, I, I think from our point of view, at least coming from a very you know, innovative perspective, mm -hmm. the separation between the purchasing departments that are customers, the innovation groups, and those actually doing the production programs, mm -hmm. there isn't really uh, a culture, let's say, of, of innovation in those corporations where there's an incentive to get their innovations that they've invested in into the purchasing uh, bids, right? So they're not soliciting bids for innovative technologies. They're spending the time and the money on the development, but they're not having a clear path to get that into their supply base, right? So I think that that disconnect, whether it's coming from a lack of incentives at those companies, uh, excessively complex corporate structures and bureaucracy, uh, general complacency of the labor force that they're hiring, uh, or the education level and age of their employees. Mm -hmm. Right, most of those are influencing the move towards innovations versus mm -hmm. the legacy technologies that have very known costs and, and uh, detriments and benefits. Um, true, I think you, you you rightly highlighted that. But um, as as industry players, what can we do to make sure that uh, all players within the industry uh, come towards the innovation and adapt it at a faster rate? Yeah, I think it's uh, these these companies need to understand their customer base, where what direction their product is moving towards, which is higher diversification of their product portfolios, mm -hmm. uh, more offerings of the same product in different varieties for their customers. These companies that are manufacturing those products have that same conserved cost or potentially for each individual product that they're differentiating off of one common type. Uh, that high mix rate has a high investment aspect. And if they want to remain competitive, maintain their margins, they're going to need to start finding more innovative solutions to do so, not just innovative technologies like 3D printing parts themselves, but innovative technologies like 3D printing a tool that then can create a million parts, mm -hmm. right? They're investing in that one core technology that actually provides efficiencies to them, helps them drive towards industry 4.0 and more automation uh, versus doing legacy uh, technologies, manufacturing operations, which have known costs and, and known benefits. I see you rightly pointed that out. Um, now, moving to um, our next session, tell me um, a little bit from your point of view, how important is the cooling phase, uh, I mean, in the plastic injection process as a whole, and what impact does it have on the product quality and cycle time? Well, I mean, obviously the cooling phase is, is vital to the complete mm -hmm. molding process, uh, including the, the heating of the tool prior to injection, as well as the cooling down to demold. Uh, but the mold temperature dictates how the material will flow into the mold, as well as how it will set up and become solid. And depending on the resin, elevated mold temperatures may be required, specific to the expected texture and loss level that you're trying to achieve. Um, but obviously, lower mold temperatures will then reduce the cycle time and provide higher yields, although it would create dimensional uh, lack of uh, dimensional integrity uh, in that part, right, which trying to balance that out. Um, obviously, higher temperatures increase the shrink rate and decrease temperatures, decrease the shrink rate of the materials. So there's a lot of things to balance there. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see it's it's crucial throughout. True. And I think. Uh, uh most likely cooling is something that uh, most of the individuals within the within the plastic injection industry want to want to really focus on and um, it's 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 something that not a lot of people can do it successfully 
Mm-hmm. Um, so now moving further, what are the common issues or pain points encountered uh, during the mold cooling process in the plastic injection uh, from your point of view? Yeah, especially coming from a uh, first and foremost, a tool maker that would be trying out those tools and, and working out those molding issues. Uh, during that initial molding trial, we will typically find you know rib features sticking or, or tearing away from the part. And um, we also see heat sinks, flow lines, warpage, gate freeze off, and any other issues that might might show up from uh, from inefficient mold cooling. Yeah. Now, if I want to ask you another question, um, how do manufacturers typically approach mold cooling optimization and monitoring? And um, are there any existing solutions or practices in place? Uh, that uh, mold designers or molders are are using? Yeah, so in most cases, it's a combination of the resin suppliers, manufacturing parameters, drying, mm-hmm. molding, and such, um, the experience of the mold designer, and their understanding of mold flow and the molding process is crucial. Um, and then obviously your molding technician who's actually collecting that data, getting that feedback at the press, It's very important to have a robust quality system to make sure that there's that traceability. True. And uh, um, you mentioned quality systems, um, and I think it would be right to ask you, uh, what are the consequences of of inefficient mold cooling on the the final uh, Mm -hmm. uh, product quality, um, such as production cost or overall efficiency, considering we were just talking about the quality? Well, you know, in addition to poor surface finish, high scrap rates, uh, potential delays in your program timing, potential for additional sorting operations due to the scrap um, and reduced shot capacity. For a lot of companies, it's a more, uh, I'd say more commercial issue Mm -hmm. where you're quoting up front, assuming a lot, right? And if you're quoting incorrectly, and you're predicting the wrong cycle time, you're losing money right off the bat, right? And, and you're time. also, you, I mean, quality, uh, cycle time, uh, just expected costs are all skewed. Um, and I think that is is by far the, the biggest impact uh, on, on a company's bottom line. I see. Um, considering your company is, is uh, you know, sitting right on the cusp of innovation, uh, are there any emerging trends or advancements in mold cooling uh, and mold cooling technology that you find interesting or promising? I mean, for us specifically, obviously with 3D printing, we've got the mm-hmm. uh, ability to put conformal cooling and heating into virtually anything that we're we're building. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't understand why anybody would not embrace those technologies, as that's essentially all we're doing is we're heating up plastic and cooling down plastic. So mm-hmm. since that's the most crucial aspect of the process, you know, if we're able to improve that with 3D printing and further optimize that with simulation software, I think that combination helps us very early on in the process, eliminate a lot of room for error. True. And I think uh, those simulation softwares can be be helpful for all stakeholders. So, Um, so considering we are talking about simulation software, let me ask you, how does simulation software as a whole fit into the broader uh, digital transformation efforts uh, within the plastic injection industry? Yeah, well, I, I think obviously the software is is essential, uh, mm-hmm. but the cost of the simulation software has historically been a major barrier to usage, widespread usage. Mm-hmm. I think having a cost-effective simulation solution available early in the design phase would definitely mm-hmm. provide the ability to identify and then create designs to avoid potential hot spots, areas for additional venting, areas of high pressure requiring reinforcement, um, areas where you'd expect poor flow rates and the filling of thin walls, um, all before the blocks have ever been ordered. And that directly increases the confidence in the cost and timing that we'd be quoting to our customer, right? And that can apply to anybody with a, a molding business. True. And um, based on your uh, expertise, uh, what advice would you give to manufacturers who are looking to enhance their mold cooling process and adopt new technologies? Um, I'd say obviously 3D print your tools, uh, <laughs> but also I would say 
adapt or, or apply the, the simulation softwares that are available or utilize some company that is using them, has access to them, mm -hmm. um, just so you can improve your, your basic understanding of what's one available to be used. Uh, two, if it actually has a benefit, which it, it does, but people need to experience that benefit for themselves. Um, and I think going through those you know, feasibility studies and really exploring companies, exploring their own process and being a little bit more self-critical, they'll come up and figure out that it's it's very beneficial to do these simulations, to consider 3D printing, and to look at what the total process looks like for them versus just focusing on one single segment and thinking it will change their entire business. I see. And um, now if I would uh, shift the gears a little, there are a lot of people who, I mean, mold in, 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 in mold designing and, and in uh, part producing who might not be a big fan of, of scientific methods though, or who might not have enough time to incorporate scientific methods. Uh, what do you, how do you convince them? What are the benefits of using scientific methods in the plastic injection industry? I mean, the key word is to be exact. You know, that mm -hmm. is what we're all trying to accomplish. We're all striving towards. We have a variety of levels of, of success in being mm -hmm. exact, but I think the scientific method allows us to to compensate for human nature, to, to stay outside of the lines and keeps us within the lanes and allows for efficient and repeatable processes to be established. Um, in molding specifically, it would reduce the load on the molding machine, reduces the time to the first part, uh, reduces your expectations of scrap. Um, and then specifically for 3D printed tooling, we're building that data today, uh, looking at every tool we quote, we're considering what would it be for 3D printing. Even if the customer doesn't request it, it's important mm -hmm. for us to keep looking at all of these active projects and active customer demand for tooling and see when we can justify 3D printing as the most beneficial solution. And each data set that we get, it has to be going through that same repeatable process, considering the same uh, requirements, the same uh, uh, expectations. I see. And um, now, if I would ask you in terms of simulation tools uh, within the plastic injection industry, I mean, they have been there for the last two decades now. Uh, yet, um, I mean, different uh, industry surveys indicate that it's used by less than half of the industry. In your opinion, what could that, why could that be the case? I think it comes down to just basic costs, cost mm -hmm. of access. That mm -hmm. is probably number one by far. Uh, number two would be the cost of the training or the complexity of use. Mm -hmm. You know, between those two, once the cost is easy for a company to swallow, now getting usability out of that, that software is a different story. Is it going to take us a week or two weeks or a month or a year to learn mm -hmm. the software and really incorporate it into our, our process? Is that feasible? Do we have those resources to dedicate a certain person to learning this new technology? If it's a quick learning curve, mm -hmm. very short, you know, it's low cost, short learning curve, that's perfect, but that's not most technology these days, right? It's usually overly complex, overly expensive, and typically too much of a pain to change versus the legacy programs people have been using for, for the last 20 years. Very true. And my follow-up question to you then would be, um, how can we convince the late adopters to start using simulation as soon as possible? Yeah, identifying a strategy where companies can provide software at a very reduced price point, mm -hmm. uh, simplify you know, the user interface, um, and then have break, uh, readily available technical and customer service. You know, Those three points will sell technology. True. I have a last question for you, which is um, more or less as someone who has spent a considerable amount of time talking to all stakeholders within the plastic injection molding industry, uh, in your experience, how can front-end simulation minimize the miscommunication between the mold designer and the plastic part manufacturer? Well, speaking for PMT in, in general, we love feasibility studies and we conduct mm -hmm. one for every single mold we design. Mm -hmm. um, even when we have a conventional request, we still do the feasibility on the 3D printing and try to see 
really how much can we learn about what's possible, what, what opportunities exist for this customer. Uh, the front end simulation allows for a significant reduction in the time it takes to prepare that study and helps us be much more accurate when we're presenting, especially before we've been paid any money, before we've been nominated for any business. It's mm -hmm. very important for us to actually know ahead of time every detail that we can, every consideration that would affect the quality of the part delivered to the customer and the cost and timing of that. Very true, and I think um, a software that can that can really help speed that process would be would be uh, would be a game changer, you know, more or less. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Well, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate all the time that you have uh, uh, given us, and I and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me.